Are you trying to figure out which Arduino board to buy? There's like a million of them out there. So how are you supposed to know which one to get? Is it even going to work with, you know, like the Arduino ecosystem, all that stuff? In this video, I'm going to show you seven tips. Let's call them criteria to help you choose which Arduino board to buy. Hopefully it will help take some of the uncertainty out of the whole process. Now, all the tips I'm about to talk about and a bunch more is available in this Arduino buying guide bundle. You can download it at this QR code or just down in the description. So check it out. I think you'll like this PDF. It's pretty darn in depth. All right. So the first tip might seem really obvious, but if you're new to Arduino, this is something you need to understand. You need to make sure that the Arduino you get is Arduino compatible. So what that means is that the hardware board you get can work with the Arduino IDE, which is the Arduino Integrated Development Environment, and with Arduino code, all right? So Arduino is kind of more of an ecosystem, right? You've got the actual physical hardware, you've got the Arduino IDE, and then you've got the code. So the board you buy needs to work with all of those. Now, here's where it gets a little bit weird, all right? So there's a company named Arduino, and they make Arduino boards. But they did this really peculiar thing, which is open source the hardware for their designs. And so other companies, are allowed to take the exact design of their boards and manufacture their own boards and then they can resell them to everybody okay now if they take an exact copy of the of the schematic and create a board we call that a clone so that would be an Arduino clone but let's say there's a company out there who gets their inspiration from an Arduino board and then maybe add some features or that kind of thing usually well at least I call it an Arduino variant so you've got Arduino boards made by the official Arduino company okay and then you have Arduino clones those are just exact copies of the Arduino boards except made by not Arduino, so you know some Chinese manufacturers usually. And then you have Arduino variants, which are inspired by Arduino board designs. They might share a lot of common features, but usually they have some value adds. Now, all of those type of boards should be Arduino compatible. So you should be fine when you buy it. Usually it will say the board is Arduino compatible on the sales page. Now the Arduino ecosystem is so ubiquitous that it's very likely the board you get is going to be Arduino compatible, but it's just worth mentioning. But here's what, where some of the differences start to come up. You're gonna find that with official Arduino boards, they're gonna work like pretty much seamlessly with the Arduino IDE. You plug it in, it's like plug and play. They work great. And there's tons of support. Like Arduino has an amazing forum. So you can ask questions, get answers. Like it's a good, well-supported hardware system. Now, if you pick up an Arduino clone, these are usually going to be less expensive than official Arduino boards. You're probably not going to have any support whatsoever, at least through the manufacturer. Usually, again, it's just a Chinese company kind of selling them on Amazon or Alibaba. And then finally, you know, the Arduino variants, they may or may not have support depending on the company that made them. If it's a reputable company like your Adafruits, your Spark Funds, then it's very likely they're going to have, uh, you know, a good support structure where you can kind of like ask questions, figure out maybe something's wrong with it or trying to understand the hardware, that kind of thing. And again, Arduino variants are generally going to be more expensive than Arduino clones. Now, my personal recommendation, and just take this with a grain of salt, is to start with an official Arduino board. That way you know it's going to work with the Arduino ecosystem. It's really not that much more money. And it also supports, you know, like this whole ecosystem, which is great. Now, after that, once you're more comfortable using the Arduino ecosystem, you know, it makes a lot of sense to try these different uh, clones, variants. I mean, that, again, that whole open source hardware, this was part of the idea. All right, the second tip is to make sure you get an Arduino board that has a processor fast enough for your use case. So Arduino boards are microcontroller development boards. So on every single Arduino board, there's a microcontroller. And the whole idea of the circuit board is to help you use that microcontroller. Now, different Arduino boards have different microcontrollers. And the Arduino company doesn't make these microcontrollers. They only make the circuit board, right? It's kind of like how some computer manufacturers will use Intel or AMD processors in their computers, but you know they don't make those processors. But the idea is that different Arduino boards have different microcontrollers and some microcontrollers, the processor on them is faster than others. Where this comes into play is if you plan on doing lots of data manipulation in your code. Think like big tables of data, or maybe you're trying to do some image processing or audio processing. That's when you're going to want to favor an Arduino board 
with a faster processor. But lots of applications you might have do not require a fast processor, and so you don't really need to sweat about it. The lowest Arduino processor runs at 16 megahertz. That's 16 million instructions per second. So, I mean, that's pretty fast for, you know, just your everyday project. All right, tip three, how much memory do you need? So let's just talk briefly about memory on a microcontroller. Usually you're gonna have flash memory, RAM, and you might have some EEPROM. So flash memory is where the code that you write actually gets stored. And that memory is called non-volatile. It doesn't go away. So when you turn off the power to your microcontroller and turn it back on, every all the data that got saved in flash, that's still there. So the program you wrote doesn't get lost, right? But then there's another type of memory called RAM, so you, which you've probably heard of, random access memory, and that is called volatile memory. So when you turn the Arduino board off, all that memory is kind of like lost, right? So if the project you have is going to include lots of different libraries, or if it needs to store lots of strings, which are just you know letters, words of characters and text that maybe need to be displayed, something like that, if they're going to store all those in Flash, or if you've got a bunch of lookup tables on there for perhaps displaying a certain type of font, those are things that are going to eat up your Flash memory. And so you're going to want to favor a board that has more Flash memory. As far as RAM goes, if your application includes doing lots of calculations while the program is running, maybe like matrix multiplications or things like that, then you're going to want to make sure that the board has more RAM on it. Now, there's also another type of memory called EEPROM, which is electrically erasable read-only memory, and those are on, you know, sprinkled in some of the different boards that you can get, and those are also non-volatile where you can save some data to it, so that might be something worth checking out as well. It depends on the scope of your project. Lots of of projects can be handled just with the Arduino Uno R3, which has 32 kilobytes of flash and two kilobytes of RAM. So that might not sound like a lot, but it really gets the job done for a ton of projects. All right, so tip four or criterion four, you need to think about how much IO you need. So IO is just short for input output, and it represents all these pins on the outside of your Arduino board. Now, not all of these, you know, these little plastic pieces, they're called headers. Not all of those little holes are input output pins. Some of them are dedicated to supplying power or ground or perhaps other signals, but most of them are GPIO, which stands for General Purpose Input Output. Now, different kinds of Arduino boards have different amounts of I.O. And if you have a project that's going to have tons of different sensors, or maybe one of the sensors you're using or one of the peripherals you're using requires a lot of I.O., then you're going to need a board that has more of it. Now, Arduino has these different form factors that roughly kind of correspond to the amount of I.O. Most Arduino boards are going to have around 20 I.O. pins. That's just kind of a general. But if you go into the mega family of boards that's got like 50 something pins on it so that's a lot more giga has even more than that and then if you go into the pro series they've got these special connectors you can do that each of them adds like 80 pins each now not all of those are gpio some of them are specific for different communication protocols but still that's a whole lot of io now on the other end there are some really small arduino boards or clones or variants that might only have a handful of io but again, it really depends on what your aim is. If you have a project and it only has one sensor and that sensor only takes one pin, do you need all that extra I.O.? You know, so it's kind of a trade off there. Now, not all input output pins are created equal. Some of them have special functions. And I talk more about that in that buy, Arduino buying guide. So again, if you want to check that out, you can get it at this QR code or down in the description. Tip five, you should decide whether you want to get a Arduino board that has an operating voltage of 5 volts or 3.3 volts. So the operating voltage is the voltage at which the microcontroller runs at, like, you know, the, the power it needs to operate. But it's closely tied to what's called the logic level voltage, and that is the voltage level on which the pins, you know, those input-output pins we were talking about, on how they communicate. So a 5-volt board communicates at a different logic level than a 3.3 volt board, typically. All right, there are some exceptions. There are some uh, microcontrollers that have a 5 volt operating voltage, but they communicate at 3.3 volts logic level. Now, 5 volt and 3.3 volt aren't the only logic levels. There's ones that are lower, but for all intents and purposes, the two you're going to care about are the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt. Now, where this becomes important is when you're thinking about communicating with different peripherals. Some peripherals are going to normally operate 
at a 5 volt logic level, or they might operate at a 3.3 volt logic level. So basically what happens is if you have a board with a 3.3 volt logic level, it may not be able to directly communicate with a board that runs at a 5 volt logic level and five volt signals could potentially damage a board running at 3.3 volts. Now there happens to be these things called level shifters. They're these separate integrated circuits that you can use that allow you to translate from you know, a 3.3 volt to a five volt or five volt to a 3.3 volt. But you know, it's just additional hardware you gotta think about. So when you can kind of marry up your operating voltage and the logic level voltage, it makes life a lot easier. Now just a quick point of clarity. When we're talking about a board's operating voltage, it's different than how much voltage you need to, pow to power the board, right? So if an Arduino has an operating voltage of five volts, then what you actually have to apply or what you can apply for like a power source is gonna be higher than that. It could be much higher, but it's definitely gonna be higher than five volts. It'll be like a range, right? Because there's gonna be a voltage regulator on that Arduino board that's gonna step down that voltage so to make sure that the microcontroller always has the uh, voltage supply that it needs. Sometimes, you know, that gets a little bit confusing, so I just wanted to mention it. Now, another factor when deciding whether you want a 5 volt or a 3.3 volt board is if this project's going to run on a battery. So if you need to get the longest life possible out of this battery, then having a board with a lower operating voltage is going to help you in that regard. Now, if it just so happens that that board is also doing a bunch of crazy stuff like Wi-Fi and BLE, then, you know, that's going to eat up a lot of juice too. But still, you know, on, on the whole, it's better to go that direction if you're looking to uh, maintain battery life. All right, tip six, should you just get an ESP32? Now, you might be wondering, hey, what's this ESP32 thing? Well, ESP32 are super inexpensive microcontrollers and there's a bunch of Arduino boards, clones and variants that use this microcontroller. What's cool about them is that they have Wi-Fi and BLE built right in. So it's not like you have to get an extra peripheral to connect your board, you know, to the internet of things and all that interesting stuff. Plus these ESP32s, they just have a bunch of features. And they're also pretty inexpensive, especially if you buy just some cheap one off of Amazon or Alibaba or something like that. So it's like, hey, why not just get that? So here's my answer to this, and maybe it's controversial, but I would say if your project doesn't require Wi-Fi or it doesn't require BLE, then using an ESP32 may be a bit of overkill because there is a little bit of overhead, a little bit of complexity there that the ESP32 is gonna bring to your project. If you're just getting started especially, and let's say you're just trying to learn the ropes, then I would actually push you away from the ESP32 perhaps, learn those basic Arduino functions on a different board that's a little bit more straightforward and then you know if you've got an IOT project you know jump into an ESP32 but you know that's just kind of my recommendation all right tip seven I guess I'll call it criteria seven I don't even know if this is a criteria but you might be wondering hey how much money should I be spending on these Arduino boards well if you're getting like a starter Arduino board usually you're going to look to spend between 20 and 30 dollars and that's going to be from like the Arduino company or a reputable vendor like SparkFun or Adafruit or any one of those companies that make Arduino variants about 20 or 30 bucks USD now if you need one of those boards that has more IO you're going to be looking at a price jump to about $40 to $70 USD. And if you want to go the Pro Series Arduino boards, which are actually developed to be used in industry, you might be looking at $100 or more per board. Now, on the other end of all this, there are super cheap boards. You can get like a handful of different development boards for, you know, sometimes 10 bucks that you're going to buy on Amazon or Alibaba or somewhere like that. It's just important to note that there's going to be no support for those boards as far as like through the vendor. Like if something doesn't seem to be working, you're just going to be kind of out of luck. What's nice about the Arduino, official Arduino boards and some Arduino board variants and stuff is that there's quite a bit of support for them, which can be super helpful. But that's just my two cents. That Arduino buying guide bundle I mentioned, it's got a bunch of charts in it that kind of map out a bunch of the different Arduino boards as far as like the IO, processor speed, cost, memory, all that kind of stuff. Plus it has some quick picks in there. So maybe there's just like a specific use case you have, got some recommendations in there. Plus just a bunch of descriptions about these different tips we talked about. Again, you can download that at this QR code right here or just write down in the description. Now if you're just getting into Arduino, the next video you should watch is this one right here. It is going to get you up and running with Arduino in no time. This one right here.